everybody. Thank you all so much for coming out to the Aquarily Womaris Me and Why event. Um, my name is Grace and I'm a student representative from SAA. And just for like a little background of our event, um, we first began the series in 2016. And since then we've had so many amazing speakers come on and talk about like their diverse career paths and how like they've all led to their different amounts of success. And we just hope the students can take away from something from this event, whether you're interested in film media, which is the topic we're going to be discussing tonight. Um, so for a brief run through of our event, we're going to be having a main Q&A discussion with our moderator and our speaker, Roxy, for the first 30 minutes, leading into our chat Q&A um, for the next 10 minutes, uh, where you'll all be able to ask questions directly to our speaker. Um, and then lastly, we'll also have an optional 10 minute uh, networking session at the end, so feel free to stay for that if you have time to. Um, but yeah, but just for some housekeeping rules, um, please be sure to keep your microphone muted throughout the event. Um, and feel free to submit any questions you have for our speaker directly using the chat function anytime throughout the event. Um, and then we'll be getting through them during our Q&A session. So, um, but other than that, that's all I have for me. And I'll now be handing it back over to our UCI Alumni Association Executive Director, Jeff Minhas. So, feel free to take it away, Jeff. Oh, the floor is all yours, Jeff. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I just got disconnected from Zoom, but I am back. Uh, thank you, Grace. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight for What Matters to Me and Why for Alumni. This is a unique event series where um, you know, many students may not realize how big the alumni world is uh, in the anteater community, but it is huge. And substantial 206,000 degree alumni all around the world. As you can imagine, they're in different positions, different areas of the world, different countries, regions, different careers, different phases in life, different age groups. Uh, but by and large, alumni really want to come back and connect with students and help students. This program has been actually really successful over the past um, I don't know how many years it's been, probably four, where maybe even more, four or five, where we've been spotlighting unique, interesting, successful alumni in a variety of different um, areas in life. Uh, alumni love to share their perspective and hopefully that uh, is, an, is a forum for you students uh, and young alumni in the audience to learn from them, to get the chance to ask questions uh, uh, of them about their life path, about their experience at UCI, about any number of things. So uh, tonight we will be doing just that with a very uh, special featured guest that we'll all be excited to introduce momentarily. But first, I just wanted to welcome you on behalf of the UCI Alumni Association. Uh, our uh, staff, our alumni volunteers of, of whom there are hundreds, and the university uh, are, you know, we exist to connect students and alumni with resources at the university. And I just want you all to know that we are here uh, now, we will be here with you forever. You're an anteater now, you're an anteater for life. And we have a commitment to provide you with engaging services, uh, engaging um, opportunities for you to stay in touch with your university, stay active, give back, um, attend uh, interesting events in the future, be a member. Uh, so just don't be a stranger. You know, once you graduate, the Alumni Association is here for you and hopefully we'll be providing relevance to you throughout your, your life. That is our goal. We wanna keep you engaged in the pride that we all have here at UCI. So thank you for joining us. Now I would like to invite our featured speaker uh, to the virtual podium. Uh, we're going to have a hopefully a riveting conversation. Uh, if if I do my job, then the conversation will have been riveting because I can guarantee you our speaker will be riveting in her own right. Uh, so let me give a very very brief introduction of Roxy Shee. She is a freelance filmmaker, 
Uh, however, I wanted to add beyond that that she's an, an internationally acclaimed Emmy nominated writer and director and speaker. On the side of her actual career, uh, there are some very interesting things and her career list of accomplishments is quite long. Uh, you all had access to her full bio when you registered for this event. So I'm not gonna repeat that whole uh, bio because she has so many accomplishments, we don't have time to list them all. But I have to point out that on the side, Roxy enjoys playing violin, freestyle whacking, vogue slash voguing, and reading tarot. She does believe in giving back to her community and was a co-founder of the Taiwanese American Film Festival in Los Angeles. And she also hosts a lifestyle podcast. So with that in mind, everyone in the audience, please join me in giving Roxy a virtual welcome. Thank you, Roxy. Hello. I don't know if I'm, am I, am I here? Can everyone see me? I are. am like weird with the Zoom thing. It's my first time talking in a collegiate setting on Zoom. I've dreamed of this this whole past year because there's nothing more that I would love than to be with all of you in the same room, seeing all of your faces, um, because that's what I really love because I have not forgotten what it was like to be in your shoes, but also not really knowing what it is like in your shoes during a time like this. So I just wanna say, um, I admire all of you for your resilience. I hope that all of you are taking care of your mental health and taking care of yourselves and um, working really hard towards your goals. So I'm so happy to be here. Thank you, April, so much for having me, Jeff, for having me, Grace. And um, shout out to my pals, Amanda and Julianne. I see you here, MCIA. It's been 10 years since I graduated, but the line is strong. So I'm excited uh -huh. to be here. Thank you. Roxy, that, that's awesome. Uh, we, we've already learned a little bit about your commitment, uh, enthusiasm for UCI and giving back. Uh, and I'm going to ask some more about that specifically. But but yeah, you mentioned um, uh, April. April Hull, I want to give tremendous credit to. She's the uh, student alumni engagement manager at the UCI Alumni Association. She put this whole event together. Uh, some other folks have been involved with the What Matters to Me and Why series. Uh, many of you know Dean Ramin Talesh. Uh, he is uh, uh, our partner in, in putting this on. But uh, yeah, thank you, April. She she's running the show behind the scenes, but uh, she's she's phenomenal. So Roxy, um, you have had quite the journey to 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 where you are now. And what I think we'll do is I'm going to ask you some questions. We'll go kind of step by step. Um, I'm thinking timeline through specific portions of your life and career, but please um, take it in any direction you'd like. Uh, you mentioned how your experience at UCI was impactful, but let's take, let's take one step back prior to UCI. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what led you to UCI, whether it was your decision to attend UCI or your transition into college and um, how that was, uh, uh, of impact to you on your path? Of course. Um, so I made it like a promise to myself that I'm just going to be very honest and authentic and, you know, just sort of talking about my life experience on this because I feel like sometimes when you come to these panels, people just want to know some insights and tips and advice on how to get to where you are. But the thing is, is that there's so many things out of your control and Sometimes we are led to places where we didn't think we would end up. And UCI honestly was one of these places. Um, I came from a third culture background. I was born in the Netherlands. Um, and then I moved to New Jersey. My parents live in Taiwan. So I identify as Taiwanese American and I'm an only child. So immediately there was that pressure from an immigrant family to succeed and be all the things. So all my East Coast friends went to like Cornell and Princeton and here I am this artist chick that's weird never being able to strive more than a 3.5 GPA um, so therefore my parents had very high expectations of me um, UCI was a good school but it wasn't really on the radar for me I applied I got in and it was also the only university I got into so for many of you you know I didn't I was just like thinking what is my karma it turned out to be the closest university to my high school. I went to Diamond Bar High School. Any 909ers say, what's up? Um, and I wanted to go somewhere far away. I wanted to make a new journey life path for myself. I had no idea what it was that I wanted to do. 
I always had, I was always expressive my whole life, but I think that cultural context, the pressure was like, you should be a lawyer, you should be a scientist. All of these things are still very real in our experiences today, right? I'm sure a lot of you resonate with that. You resonate with that burden. You resonate with that expectation. And um, unfortunately, I never felt confident in those subjects. But I, what I did care about was the world. And I did care about where it was that we were going. So I ended up taking a social major at UCI. My parents moved back to Taiwan. I uh, lived in Campus Village my first two years at UCI. So I didn't get the dorm experience that was traditional, didn't go to you know Middle Earth, Mesa Court. I wish I had that, didn't have Brandywine. That was like the coveted, like, I don't know if that's still around, you know, place to hang out mm -hmm. back in the day. Um, and uh, I thought I wanted to study something along the signs of social justice law, something that had to do with helping welfare people who are in need. Um, but then I took my very first humanities course. I took a film 101 class, 85, film 85A. And um, that changed the course of my life. Like I, there was something about it that struck me something about Bliss Lim, Professor Bliss Lim, if you've ever taken a class with her, she's just so eloquent and so powerful in the way she talks about movie making. And I didn't know I wanted to be a director. At that point, you know, being Asian, being queer, being, um, you know, being a woman, it was impossible. There was no Lulu Wang, there was no example of this being possible. So it never crossed my mind that this is where I would end up. But I knew that I gravitated towards it. So when I was in college, I had no idea what it was that I wanted to do. I had nothing figured out. All I knew was that there was a lot of expectations on me because I kept failing, quote unquote, as a, as a daughter. Like I wasn't getting, I never took IB. I failed every AP test in high school. I don't know how you say it took me actually, but I'm very lucky to have gone to UCI because what UCI has taught me were all these other skills and all these other aspects of myself that I never knew were inside of me. It taught me about community, about the backbone of friendships, about exploring other aspects of yourself that you probably never got the opportunity to when you were living under your parents' household. So that in itself broke me open to who I really was. And I would, if I could encapsulate my UCI experience, because I know Jeff is probably gonna ask me questions and diving in deeper into these later layers of my experience, but so much of it was about knowing which direction you're going. You don't have to have it all figured out, but directionality, I was like, yes, sociology, love that. You know, study of our world, study of people, study of our environment. Yes, I love that. Where are we going? Why is everything a social construct, right? And that played into where I am today in my filmmaking. All of it has to go, all of it played a part in becoming who I am today. Every single organization I was, I was in, AFIO, MCIA, I was in the symphony for a little bit at UCI because I just, I just knew there wasn't gonna be another time when I had freedom to explore different conversations with people. Because after you graduate, you're sort of at ground zero again, no matter what decision you choose to pursue. Did I answer your question, Jeff? That was sort of like a very ooh, large hamster. No, point. no, this is this is fantastic, Roxy. Um, I, I'm taking making notes as we go because I have so many things I want to follow up with you on. Yes. And uh, keep in mind how it resonates with uh, the students in the audience. So you, um, you felt like you were failing as a daughter. Your identity is multi, 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 multi-layered based on what I would say, uh, all, all these different components that made you into who you are. But you may, um, you, you, when you were in school, like the students in the audience are right now at UCI, um, the key to you, something I wanna dig into more, was even if you didn't know exactly what you were gonna do, you had directionality. And I think that is something that is a lesson the students might like to learn more about. Many students, and I will even harken back to my 20 years ago when I was a UCI student, didn't know where I was going. Uh, many students resonate with that. They may be comfortable in their major or uncomfortable, not know what their career is going to be. So maybe you could 
elaborate on that advice, that directionality that helped guide you despite not knowing the concrete pathway? Yes. So it's like saying, um, I am a, like, if I was like a, the shape of a square, you know, um, I can't fit myself into a triangle. So I was born a square, <laughs> not to be that literally, but if, if we're just talking about like a shape, right? So even if people around me wanted me to be a chemist and I said, and they're like, it's gonna make good money. It's going, you're going to be stable. Um, you know, you're going to be well coveted, well protected for the rest of your life. And uh, no matter how many ways I push myself in whatever direction, I've always failed chemistry. By the way, I just wanna say, I failed statistics twice at UCI and they still let me walk. I'm not saying that's great advice. Please just study and do your best. But it's the, my point being that I can't force myself to be something I'm not. So what UCI has taught me more than just like what my skill sets are, for example, I have a natural talent for music and performance. Um, and that, that wasn't where I went though. I didn't become a musician. I didn't become a dancer, but I loved storytelling. This is something that's inherent in everything that I do. Um, the podcast is storytelling, right? Playing music sometimes is storytelling. Songwriting is, is storytelling. And then I thought greedily to myself, what is one thing that encapsulates everything I love? And then I thought, oh, it's filmmaking, which is such a pipe dream. It felt so impossible. I didn't go get a master's degree after university. I knew from the start I wasn't an academic, all right? So I just wanna let you know that if any of you are afraid that you can't get to where you wanna go, um, some do require, you know, certain levels of um, degrees, but like there are many ways to get to where you want to go. I just want to open that up as well. Like there's no one set way. You could get advice from many different types of people. If you go and ask many different types of people, their experience is guaranteed. It's always something different. At least they're different stories, you know? So for me, I found my strength. I said, I like to tell stories, whether it's through any of those mediums, right? So I said, all right, well, I can't lie to myself. When I <laughs> graduated UCI, I, I didn't pursue a master's degree. Um, so I didn't get, I didn't go study directing. I didn't study film production. I didn't study any of that. Um, I, I knew that I was somebody who learned better visually and by getting my hands dirty. So there are some things that you should start learning about yourself during this time. How do I best acquire information? How do I best acquire knowledge? How do I thrive the most efficiently given my environment and circumstances? For example, right now, the pandemic is not something that any of us could have predicted a little bit over a year ago, right? But you found yourself in this predicament and you could say, oh no, like, oh, Roxy said that, like, I need to know how I thrive the most, but we can't be around people. Sure, but it's like access to dialogue, access to people is still available, right? Conversations like this is still available. How do you make the most out of your circumstance? So the podcast came out because of the pandemic. The podcast came out because we were trying to find community with people feeling isolated. And in that came a lot of different stories that came out and people feeling heard and seen. So this is me understanding what I was naturally born with and embracing it. So I would ask all of you that during this time in college, you have freedom. You know, you have, besides your studies, all those other areas and times during your day go look at something new, find a new hobby. You know, if you dive into quantum theory, dive into it, even if you're a music major, you know, find anything that feeds your interest. Why does it feed your interest? Start seeing a theme or the connective tissue between the patterns of what it is that, feel, that you feel you're being gravitated to. So you notice like before all this happened, I don't know, are, are most of you upperclassmen? I'm just gonna assume yes. Um, so you did have you know college experience before the pandemic it was just so so much you have to ask yourself do i thrive in a large group experience do i find myself leading the team do i find myself <clears throat> offering empathy to people who are feeling less seen you know like these are also traits for you to explore outside than just your craft 
or your place of study, because these elements of your personality is what other people are going to be looking for too. So instead of like how knowledgeable you are, how, how um, academically or studious you are and how well you grade in your scores, think about what else about you makes you an asset and would make you stand out in the cloud that is everybody else, because we're all beautifully unique, right? So if there's a piece of advice, it would be to maximize this time to not only find passion in what it is that you're studying, but also get to know yourself a little bit better in terms of what your strengths are. Well, there's some things here that, that make it a good transition into the next phase I wanna talk about. So thank you for sharing that, Roxy. Now, as you addressed um, your finding your kind of directionality, some things that you identified about yourself, you, you knew you were not an academic, you wanted to pursue, uh, well, you identified things that you love, things that were natural to you, storytelling uh, amongst others, your creativity. Um, I think if, if you encourage, as you have the audience to identify those themes, the connective tissue, as you say, that would guide them on their path to whatever their career or life may be post-graduation, I, I would only imagine what's going through some of their minds is, I don't know how to convert that passion into a career. Or I don't know, like when I graduate, when I come off that commencement stage, I know what my strengths are or my passions are, but I don't know, you know, I can get a eight to five job, but that's not going to fulfill it. But that'll, you know, is that what, what path should I go on? How do I take my passions, turn it into a career? You did that. Maybe you can start talking about your transition post UCI and how you became who you became. I'm not going to lie. Your twenties are going to be tough y'all because your twenties are so much about identifying who you are to yourself and who you are to the world. So <clears throat> don't be like struggle makes, what is it? Like diamonds are cut out from like the hardest stones to crack or something, right? So <laughs> I'm just saying you, you have to, you're not going to be able to merge your passion in your career right away. Like I've been doing this for 10 years now and I could still remember what it was like to be at UCI. I still feel like it was just yesterday I was on campus with my friends going to class, going to Brandywine or like uh, going to the pub, you know, and, and this time goes by very fast. So understand that, like, how is it that you best use your time? Know that when you come out into the world, you are still being molded. You are still learning. You are still absorbing what's around you. You're not going to be able to, pers to merge that passion and career right away. For me, it didn't really start happening until three years ago when I turned 30, you know, like, but when I was struggling throughout my 20s, I'll tell you guys what I did. Okay, so I, when I graduated college, I had two choices. I could A, move back to Taiwan to be with my parents because my mom's like, you're too fat, you need to lose weight. And then do the Ang Lee thing where you just like write screenplays and I'll feed you. And then you'll become super famous and an Oscar winner. I'm like, that's really not how that happens. So <laughs> my, <laughs> my other, you know, um, <clears throat> so what I wanted to do was I said, give me six months in Los Angeles and let me see what I can make out of myself. So I knew that because I didn't have any internships, I didn't, um, I wasn't able to get any. I did a film independent one for development, but that really didn't lead anywhere. But, but still do it, you guys, like, please, like, I'm just one story, okay? I might have been a hot mess getting to where I am, but I'm just telling you, please try everything. Like, please go for it. Don't be afraid of rejection because you'll get rejected often, not just in school, but in many different forms of life, right? So just be open to it. It'll just help you grow, all right? And then, um, I couldn't get a job in the industry anywhere. I couldn't even get a job as a production assistant where I carry coffee for people. No one knew who I was, all right? So um, I did Craigslist jobs and uh, I was at Rite Aid buying tampons one day because I just you know, got this apartment across the street with my roommate. And I remembered he was checking out my items and then he said, you're not from- I wonder what he's saying. Oh, hello. Who's that? We'll remind the audience. Hopefully, you oh, can okay. uh, mute yourselves. Um, uh, and yeah, Roxy, please keep going. Um, there was this. I will never forget this man. 
he was at Rite Aid, he was checking out my items. And then I was just smiling stupidly because I just moved to Los Angeles with the whole world in front of me. And he said, uh, you're not from here. What are you here to pursue? Are you trying to be an actress? And I go, oh no, I'm not, I'm not an actress. And I said, I would like to become a director. And then he was like, ooh, mm. he's like, you're gonna get a lot of no's. And that was so disheartening to hear. Like I already knew it was difficult. I already knew it was a stretch, but I felt like I should just put it out to the universe that maybe one day I could become this person. And then he said, but once you get the first yes, the other yeses start coming. And then it was so true. It was once you are seen by someone, once someone vies for you, it leads to a whole catalyst of events. So I ended up doing this Craigslist job that was like an internship for a live video, like chat show that was online on the internet. It was in this person's garage for most of the day. I made $30 a day. And in the meantime, my friend and I split the living room and we slept on the floor, you know. Um, granted, I know not, not all of you wanna hear this story because it is really rough and tough, but I like to embrace my, my experiences however they come. Um, and we had a really good time. And uh, it was really rough. I worked for almost no money most of the time. People were like, you get paid an exposure, but you know, they abuse you for your effort, for your time. And I really had to cut my teeth. But this person who ran this garage type, you know, web show every single day became one of the most important people in my life. And um, her name was Pepper J and now she lives in um, Nevada with her husband and they own a ranch making their own movie studio. But she taught me the importance of seeing my self-worth and talent. So I didn't go to film school. I never learned how to make movies, but through her, she was like, hey, if someone pays you a compliment, say thank you. She taught me how to talk to people. And then even though I was only working for her for $10 an hour, when then, whenever people wanted to know how much I cost, she says she's 50 an hour. So immediately she became my wing woman in sort of cultivating this other work for me because she saw my value, because she saw how hard I worked. And while I worked for her and took other freelance jobs during the time, I would save maybe $2,000 a year, which is the only savings I had to make like a short film with my friends, right? Because passion trumps logic when you're still in your early 20s. Um, and then it would make festivals. And uh, one time I won a best director festival at a festival. And then she said, now you're an award winning filmmaker. And immediately because of my upbringing, you know, and being Asian, it was immediately to denounce and deflect that compliment. It was like, oh, no, 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 I'm not, I can't call myself that. And she goes, but you are. And that really recalibrated the way that I thought and the way that I saw myself. So there's a long story, but basically what happened after that was a series of events. So once I started calling myself or people started calling me an award-winning filmmaker, people start looking at me differently. Whether or not I had worth in myself or saw myself at that, as that really didn't matter. But what did matter was how I spoke of myself and how I spoke of my work. People will believe anything <laughs> as long as you have intention behind what it is that you're saying. So even though I continued to mess up, I started producing for people. I was honest. I never had experience learning. I didn't know the craft or the minutia of, of set but I was honest about my mistakes and I was always eager to learn. So I find people giving me chances again and again as I continue to grow in this industry. Pretty soon, I'll just keep it short because I know there's, there's a lot more to the story, but I ended up finding out that people are willing to invest in you. You know, when you are willing to own your mistakes and willing to work hard. If you want something bad enough, if you put your focus in on it, it will happen for you. So then pretty soon, you know, when I directed my first movie, like, I don't know how that happened. Well, I do know how it happened, but it felt impossible a couple of years before. And I remembered I produced this, there's a really quick story, this micro budget movie for this director called Seahorses. And he felt so indebted to me that I made all of this happen for him for almost no money, like got him a crew, got him artistry. We were able to make a movie, make like 17 festivals worldwide. 
and he felt like he owed me because he was in his mid forties and I was 23 years old. And he said, kid, I see you making your little movies like every year. No one's going to take you seriously until you make your first full length movie. And I said, look at me. I am an Asian woman. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen, right? For, to become a film director. And then he said, you did so much for me. Take my camera, take all my lighting, g and &E gear. It's all free. Go make your movie. Like tens of thousands of dollars worth of equipment for free. So I think at the end of the day, when you put your heart in something and you do everything with intention, everybody, like people will help you. So then literally within uh, two weeks after that, someone came to me with a script that I really wanted to direct. I said, I wanted to, di to direct it. All my friends came to help with little to no money that I had to pay them because there was, it's expensive to make a movie, right? We made the movie and then I was like, this is it. Like, there's no more after this. If this movie fails, like, I will not have a career. But I was so young. I was 26. I, I don't know how to make a movie, right? Not a good one. And then, um, but then, like, it just showed me, yes, Roxy, your first movie wasn't great. Like, if you go on IMDb, the reviews aren't great. They're just like, this is so boring. What is this, right? But someone saw it and thought it was great and then hired me for my next movie. And then, then I did a series for Amazon Prime. And then you know, I got represented and now I'm a full-time director. So it's so bizarre. But for me, like nowadays I still look back and I still have so much gratitude because I still can't believe the life that I have because it felt like I was set up to fail straight from the beginning because I was so lost and I wasn't, I didn't have a set determined path. I wasn't going to get a PhD. I wasn't going to be a pharmacist. I wasn't, you know, I was more open to what could happen. But once I knew what it was that I loved and I loved people, I loved leading. MCIA and FIO taught me that and SPOP taught me that, like that I like to lead a group of people. I like to combine passion together and create joy. So naturally film, even though it's a high risk environment, um, was a very compelling and stimulating environment for me to succeed. Well, uh, there's there's a lot of great nuggets here that I am taking down. I'm going to kind of recite some of these key themes at the end. Uh, I'm very curious uh, how this is being reflected and received by the uh, dozens and dozens of students in the audience. Um, as uh, was mentioned, everyone, please, uh, if you have questions for Roxy, uh, put them in the, the chat or the Q&A so that we can get to them because I think we'll get to them probably in about eight to 10 minutes. Um, Roxy, quick thing for you, Brandywine went away, but it's back now and is better than ever. It is uh, brand new. We opened it up with a new Middle Earth tower. So. You, so <laughs> Wow. Anyone can come visit it, by the way. It, when you come back to campus, whenever we reopen, we'll, I'll take you there. It'll be fun. I can't uh, wait. Can we all please go to Ta. Um, mango green tea, please. And the popcorn chicken, please. Oh, and La Dip. La Dip. La for Dip. Life. <laughs> you know what's up. Um, okay, so uh, you mentioned um, a lot, uh, but specifically, I wanted to hone in on Pepper J. So didn't know anything about her, but she was an important figure in your life. Would you consider her a mentor? Yes. And can you talk about, well, you already did talk about the value she had for you in your life, but mentorship and how it can help um, anyone who is still kind of trying to find their success, find their, 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 their wins. I think mentorship is so important. I can only speak for my industry because um, you know, when I was starting out, there was like 0.2% of women directors were actually working. And that's not even talking about the famous ones. That's just like straight up legit making a paycheck off of anything that they're hired to do. Pepper was the first, my first mentor, because not only did she take me under her wing on how to conduct myself, how does how to be kind to others, you know, that it's not just about me. It's not just about my journey to wherever it is I want to go to look at the big picture um, and she was interesting.
She was a child star and um, she became a lawyer. She's an attorney. And then, um, and then she produces on the side. And she was in her mid sixties when I met her and she was a hippie, you know, smoked a lot of weed and I just loved her. She was so unique and smart and wonderful. And then after her, because you do outgrow mentors, by the way, like at a certain point, feel free to just like become friends. You know, I always think it's beautiful when you become colleagues afterwards. So my next mentor was um, this woman named Dina, who I met producing this movie called Sound of Magic. It's called uh, Bart Bagglesby and the Garbage Genie. It's actually coming out now after six years of being in post-production, but she was, oh my, she was incredible. Like, I never saw myself as someone who could take up space back in the day. I didn't see myself as valuable or knowledgeable. I just felt like I was faking my way through life. And she would she took, she, she said, I will take Roxy as the other producer on this movie. I will take no fee. And she goes, but I will guide her through everything and she will be on the ground. I'll be available by phone. And in those conference meetings, I remember that in the very beginning, we we're talking about like finance plans or anything that I didn't understand. She'll always say, Roxy, what do you think about this? And the beautiful part about mentorship is when you have a healthy relationship with the person who sees your potential and is willing to empower you and raise you up, you will feel that need to pay it forward later on in your career. So now I still do, um, you know, mentee programs, mentor mentee programs. I did it for my film festival because as my as a minority, it's so hard for me to access resources and knowledge because I just didn't have it, you know, or I didn't have film school resources, right? But I had access to that through a mentor that sees you and believes in you. So I highly recommend it. Please don't be shy. When you're talking, when you're thinking about asking someone to be a mentor, please make it very specific. Make sure you know what you're asking for and be very specific with your ask. You have to make this mentor think that you are, you know, it's like courting like a big job or like courting like a very important person. You just have to know that this is the reason why I've done my research. I know that will vibe. This is what I would love to learn from you. And in return, like I could gain all of this and hopefully be able to pay back that in the future. So it's beautiful now that like Dina and I, like we would get drinks and she, you know, we're colleagues now, you know? Um, so I just love it. It just builds community. Yeah, that is, that is a beautiful thing. And thank you for sharing really, really not just the importance of mentorship, but the journey of mentorship, you outgrow mentors and then you, you become friends, you find new ones, you keep going, keep pushing yourself. Yeah. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention you all can follow Roxy's advice, but we've made it very easy for you to get started with a new tool Roxy didn't have because we launched it last two years ago, the Anteater Network. Go to antnet.uci.edu. There are 8,000 anteaters on the platform. All the alumni have already raised their hands. They want to be your mentor. Search for them by industry, location, anything. And then proceed as Roxy advised. Treat it like, like an interview, like a job. You want to find someone good. Okay, so let's talk about um, some other lessons you've learned or challenges you face, Roxy. Um, first, um, maybe on the good side, uh, Describe one thing that you wish you would have had the chance to do or something that you're still trying to do, whether it was at UCI or sometime along your career pathway. Might be a tough one. Oh, this is a good question. <laughs> I don't regret anything. Um, it's, it's so strange. Like I just took a different path. I think in my earlier years in my 20 maybe 23 to 25 where i didn't feel like i was growing i think i played a mind a mind game with myself that i should have gotten go and have gotten a master's but i think that's just another way for me to fill up my time without really being honest with myself because i didn't want to have any more student debt you know huh, great country um but you know great go biden you know thank goodness that <laughs> out of the office anyways uh short um yeah just got segued there for a little bit um but i i really don't there isn't any like i just 
I think I have so much gratitude because I never thought my life could end up like this. Like surely when I was at UCI, if I close my eyes and think about my years, 10 years into the future, I would not have expected this at all. Um, so I don't regret anything. Remember every failure is just a tool for you to grow more. And there's no such thing as failure. So if you ever think that you're being set back, I want you to re recalibrate that as what you have learned and apply it as a tool belt for your future pro progress, all right? So, um, and it's also, yeah, I just think our mental health is so fragile right now. And I can't tell you what kind of environment you're going in as we come out of this pandemic because I have not been in your shoes from that. Like there was no pandemic 10 years ago. All right, so just remember to give yourselves more grace, okay? And just um, be a little bit kinder, but also be diligent. Do your, do your homework, show up to Zoom class, all right? Yeah. <laughs> Roxy, what, is, what has been your greatest moment so far? I think people would have said, um, you know, I earn, I hate saying this, but I, I win a lot of awards. <laughs> My mom was just like, my mom was just like, like, where do you put your awards? I'm like, they're just somewhere on the floor over there. Um, I don't really care about them, but you know, um, I guess the biggest moment would be the Emmy nom this year or last year, um, but it was during the pandemic. So I didn't get to dress up and go to the awards and get my goodie bag that I really wanted because that's all I really wanted and to take beautiful photos so that I could put it on my Facebook profile so that everybody could like it. That's also something that I really wanted, but it didn't happen because it was the pandemic. Um, so it was interesting because I thought that feeling would be so much stronger. Like I felt like I would feel more validated, but I didn't. Like the, I, the pandemic has really made me feel that every success is fleeting. So if you think, if you put all your energy into thinking, this one career is going to determine my happiness. This one thing, if I just get this like, entry it's all good but it's all fleeting is what i'm saying so just my biggest success is just existing i think <laughs> that's so that's so super spiritual but it's like i'm so grateful to be where i am and i think that is my greatest moment my greatest moment is here with you guys right here right <laughs> now. being in the present <laughs> is my greatest moment being able to see all of your faces on zoom wishing i could be in the same space as you breathing the same air as you when I'm, we're all, all stabbed with the vaccine and we could go get stoner fries at the pub. Like that's something I'm, I'm visualizing. But as of right now, this is my greatest moment, being here with you guys. Well, it is reciprocated uh, <laughs> for me at least, Roxy. You, you were very inspirational and making me think about my life choices as well. Just kidding. Um, you, 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 you live your life with uh, some really valuable lessons that, that I, like I said, I want to, revisit some of them for the audience for the sake of the audience um when you're when you were a uci student directionality might, might have been the most important thing uh you know a lot of students right now are are not sure exactly what their life is going to be and what what the pandemic might affect those who are graduating soon but you know you move along with directionality um what mattered it mattered that how you spoke about yourself um you deflected the award winningness of uh, you know titles that you had although you 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 win a lot of awards you learn not to deflect that and how you spoke to yourself is important being honest about your mistakes your eagerness to learn of course of course everyone will always say who's in a position like you hard work ethic is is massively important um rejection can come often and that is definitely the case we see that with alumni all the time interviewing for jobs or you know your projects in your uh freelance world but then you get a yes and then more yeses start coming right um mentorship played an important role for you but then it's not just the sake of having one mentor you outgrow them and uh and find more um and then one thing you just said there's probably not one just one thing that will control your happiness you know it's fleeting and then you got to move on and continue with your life so these things are very uh conceptual but also very applicable to the plight that many students these these days go through so um 
really, really good stuff, Roxy. Um, a, a couple more, maybe one or two more questions before we go to the Q&A. So everyone in the audience again, who's you, first, why don't you tell us who your visitor is? Oh, yeah, yeah. Who, who just video bombed Sorry. you? <laughs> Rude? Sorry. <laughs> Questions, yes, okay. sorry, yes, questions, okay. <laughs> no, no, uh, yeah, so one last open-ended question from me to you. Uh, what is your advice for students who are looking to pursue a career in your field? People may have come to this event because you are a successful filmmaker, writer, um, director. What advice do you have for people who wanna follow in your footsteps? I'm just going to say this as if the pandemic is over and we are all stabbed with the vaccine and it is fine to congregate physically again. Um, when they say that this is an industry of networking, it is very much true. It is an industry of nepotism it's about who you know. I could talk about all day about being pulled towards something, being you know, inspired and wanting to do something for the sake of artistry, but it needs to be balanced out with groundedness and practicality and also strategy. So. For me, it's like, always think about what kind of relationships you're building with people in the long term. I think this also applies to any industry is really honing in on where you want to be. So something that my father has taught me uh, when I was a little girl, I had no idea how much this has helped me. He says, when you want to see yourself somewhere, speak as if you are already there. This goes back to the intention of your word, because the thing is that whatever you say, you have to be held accountable for it, right? So if you, I'm just gonna pretend the pandemic doesn't exist. I would recommend if you are in, interested in coming into the film industry, go to film festivals, go watch films, support indie filmmakers, look at what you like, look at what you don't like, um, talk to filmmakers, say, hey, I want to like shadow your set. You know, I think something that um, the filmmaker, female filmmaker community um, and non-binary community is very strong, you know, on Facebook, on social media, we always talk about like, hey, if you're directing an episode and if it's a young unknown female filmmaker, she's like, can I come shadow for a day, come watch you on set, come see what it's like. Because we always have these illusions of what we think our career will be without truly understanding what it's like until we actually get there. I also wanna say that it might not, it will most likely not be what you envision it to be or what you expect it to be. So give yourself permission to evolve. Also give yourself permission to step away no matter what age you are. I think that's something we also have to normalize is that you are able to shift your career when you want to. You, whatever you've invested in your education and your experience up until a certain point will still prove valuable um, in your future endeavors as well. So that's something to keep in your tool belt. Um, networking is very important in my industry. The more that people know you, the more that your name gets spoken. Nowadays, I'm lucky enough that my reputation precedes me. So, um, <laughs> So they're just like, oh yeah, like we're looking for, people like to be more inclusive now and talk about diversity. They're like, we want like a female Asian director for this and like, oh, Roxy, you know, like she's great at horror and science fiction and genre stuff, which is also something super cool that I didn't expect would turn out to be my life. So um, that sort of, sort of helps, you know, and then when you have clout, when you're finally in a position where you can set the rules, that's when you can start, your thirties are gonna be great guys, just like, Trust me, just your 30s are gonna be so awesome. But you gotta get through your 20s first where you gotta go do all of that handshaking, all of that like very low pay, all of that discovering who you are, what it is you like, what it is you're good at for you to finally flourish in your 30s. Wow. Well, Roxy, that, that, is, that is wonderful. Thank you for sharing that advice. Uh, now we do have some questions. People wanna hear from you uh, directly. so. I'm going to bring back, reintroduce Grace. Grace, are you gonna be able to go through some of the questions from the audience? Yes, definitely. Thank you for that, Jeff. And thank you for Roxy for sharing everything thus far. So we do have a couple questions in the chat. So and feel free to add more in the next couple minutes. We'll be going through them. But Roxy, so uh, our first question is from Angela and it asks uh, how you mentioned a few times about your Taiwanese American background. And they're wondering if your ethnic background had affected anything in your film career or had it made it more difficult to you for you starting out in the industry because of this characteristic. In the beginning, I just 
identifying myself as Asian American, I was not specific. I did not think people cared. I did not think people would listen or that they would, hi, Joe. It's good to, happy belated birthday, Joe. Okay, sorry. Um, and I didn't think they would care. And I just thought maybe if I just put myself in this category, it'll make me unique enough, but also not make me feel like I'm being so nosy. Do you know what I mean? Like, like, like being nosy or being demanding of myself because I felt like I needed to assimilate first before I could start making demands. And it wasn't until that I got older, you know, cause I grew up renouncing my Asian background because of the immigrant experience and growing up on the East coast. So it's sort of like a transition back into my culture and who, who is rooted the blood that flows through my veins. And it's become so important to my work, it's become so important to my identity. And you're going to realize the older you get, how much these things mean to you and how much it means to the world around you and the impact that you have. And it's not enough that they're just making Asian American stories on TV. It's not enough that they're just saying, it's a token Asian person in a CW show. It's fresh off the boat represents all of this. No, it doesn't, right? Like Thai experiences are different. Japanese experiences are different. And then you start going to the intersectional aspects. What happens if you're a third culture kid? What happens if you're Taiwanese queer and you, you know, have like a Latinx partner? And what are those stories like, right? These are the stories that our world has. And it's not just catered to Asian American. It's not good enough. So it's very important. That's what I'm saying. So that's why I created the Taiwanese American Film Festival because I knew that there are other when, when people started saying, oh yeah, you want a Taiwanese American director? There's Justin Lin, uh, there's, who's too expensive for most people at my age, uh, at my range. And they're like, uh, yeah, uh, who else? And they're like, oh, there's Roxy Shi, right? And then they go, Roxy, you're like the one. And I'm like, no, I'm not the one because I know for a sure fact, there's so many of them that you haven't heard about. So I created this specific little niche festival in the midst of all these larger ones because I knew that people had to see us, right? And they're just as talented, just as capable as I am. I just got lucky because I'm brazen and loud and people like my purple hair that I get seen more often. But, you know, I, I, I just had timing worked out for me. Um, but representation is very important and who you are is important and people should see that. Thank you so much for sharing that, Roxy. That was super inspiring. That was a great question. Thank you. So our next question comes from Thomas and they ask, what advice would you offer new graduates as they navigate like this industry where it's often an expectation that you work for free or for exposure, but also trying to gain appropriate compensation for your skills and time? I think it's important to identify who is good for you. And sometimes we don't realize what relationships would nurture us or ones that would bring us down. So I didn't know that when I was in my early 20s, I took work from very toxic people who used me time and time again, made me work until four in the morning and I had no boundaries. And as a person in their 20s, I'm sure a lot of you don't know what your boundaries are. You would stay up all night, you know, um, make people happy or, you know, it's natural. You have to go through it in order to identify it. So I would say my biggest recommendation Keep people who believe in you around you. Keep people who understand what it is that you're trying to doing, motivate you. Work laterally, um, not vertically. So what I mean by that is don't expect thinking you're gonna be working for Chris Nolan on your next job. Look at the people around you, you know, just friends um, from school or in the community that are just also just as passionate as you are. Collaborate with them, you know, because they know how hard it is. Um, so just, I think your tribe is the most important thing because it's not going to be easy. The least you can do is have people around you who will motivate you every time you feel it, you have a setback, right? But I promise, I promise, I promise, I promise if you endure past those challenges and you keep your eyes on the goal and you work with integrity, you'll get to where you want to be eventually. Thank you so much for that, Roxy. So we actually you, we actually are running a little low on time. So we'll have one more question. Um, and this one is um, from Elise and it asks, 
Um, how do you stay inspired, motivated, and focused even when your mental health is not at its best? Um, I, again, it comes back to who you surround yourself with. Um, I had a very hard time opening myself up, um, being vulnerable with people. Um, I think I'm a Capricorn, so if that means anything to all of you astrology geeks out there, it means I really like to work and I, my life is very career oriented. Um, so it's hard for me to be able to open up myself, but this pandemic has really made me confront myself. I live by myself, you know, um, LA is pretty severe and it's lockdown. And um, I've really learned to lean into those people that I trust even more so to develop those relationships and um, be more empathetic, have more compassion and expecting that same compassion in return. Um, to stay inspired, it's very easy for me. It's, it's very easy for me. I think anytime I have dialogue with someone, they inspire me. You know, I think if I were to have a dialogue with any single one of you, I would find something that I could pull from that inspires me as well. Like when I'm older, like much older, I'm going to take a younger mentor because I'm not going to understand the world then, right? So I definitely understand that as things shift, it's like, I'm going to be the one that's like not knowing as much and you guys will be the ones that are teaching me things. Like what's a TikTok? Don't know, right? So, <laughs> so it's it goes both ways. And I think inspiration will come anywhere as long as you let it, right? Thank you so much for sharing that, Roxy. So unfortunately, we are running a little bit low on time and I understand that there are a lot of questions from our audience, which is so great. Um, so I was wondering if there's any way that the audience can reach out to you afterwards the event, um, if you could share that. Yes, uh, I don't know what TikTok is. So I have an Instagram, if any of you guys know what that is. Um, it's just Roxy She. Okay, you could DM me. You could be like, yo sister, I need some help. I'll try my best um, with what I can. I'm usually, I don't know, for some reason, 24 hours never seems enough. Um, I'm also a tarot reader. Um, so uh, Julianne has had one with me. I'll give her a shout and see what the reviews are like. Um, and then I also run a podcast called Two Horny Goats on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Um, so a lot of it talks about identity, sexuality, navigating um, the conversations we wish our parents could have had with us or that we could have had growing up that we didn't. So we talk about very difficult things. Um, and uh, yeah, you could talk. I'm like so accessible. Go on my website, email me. Uh, just email me or talk to me. I'm like super lonely. Look at me. I just talked to my dog and she hates me. So um, yes, I'm here for you guys as much as I can. <laughs>